right? And so when people come up and they say, you know, you haven't found anything, you guys ought to give it up. And I get emails like that every day. I respond to them that this is completely analogous to going to Africa in search of megafauna, right? Landing your ship on the shore and examining one, in, one city block of Africa and then saying, well, that's it. No hippos, no elephants here. You know, I think I'll go home. There's no megafauna. There are no megafauna in, uh, in Africa. And that would be early days. That would be premature. The same with SETI. Okay. Now, the Allen Telescope Array has a design goal of not 42 antennas, which is what it has now, but 350. Okay. Now, building the rest is pretty straightforward. We know how to do that now. What's missing here is the check. So if one of you want to buy an antenna, you can buy an individual antenna. I recommend you buy the whole array. It's per antenna less expensive for you. And <laughs> so that's the deal here. This is the possible result of that. Okay, what's plotted here? This is one of those 12 plots. It's, what's plotted here, I, I just did a little bit of uh, geometry here and then an extrapolation of what this instrument will do in the future because we know what the technology will do. You're all well aware of Moore's Law. You live in the Silicon Valley. You know that the price of uh, uh, computers drops by a factor of two at any given performance level every 18 months. So the same is true for SETI. SETI is mostly digital electronics. It gets faster all the time, doubling in speed on average ever since Frank Drake's original experiment every 18 months. So what I've got plotted here is how far out into space, hey, say, how far out have we examined all the interesting star systems? Okay, so, you know, uh, here 100 light years out, and then, you know, a few years later, we're at 200 light years and so forth. What's really interesting here are these uh, numbers. These are what are called estimates, which is a euphemism for guesses as to how many societies are out there broadcasting a signal we could pick up. Uh, Carl Sagan figured there might be a million. If he's right, then we should trip across ET before 2015. Uh, Isaac Asimov figured 670,000, then it takes till 2022 20 or something. Frank Drake himself typically says 10,000. Okay, now, I've asked Frank many times. I don't know if Frank's in the audience. He may be here. You can ask him why he came out or how he came up with this number, and that's some sort of secret sauce. Uh, but... In any case, it's the most conservative number. And even if you take the most conservative number, then it, it's still the case that this experiment's going to pay off in two dozen years. Okay. All right. Now, you might say, yeah, but, you know, these are all guesses. They're all guesses. And they are. They are guesses. But on the other hand, these are guesses by people like Carl Sagan, Frank Drake, and so forth. These are the people that motivated this whole search. So if you feel sufficiently uh, impressed with the arguments that have been made for doing this, then the result of that is that you should expect success fairly quickly. Right? This is not like building Salisbury Cathedral in, in England, which took, you know, what, I don't know how many, how many centuries it took to build that pile of stones there, okay, where you say, well, my great-grandkids will do it. You know? Either it's going to work within a generation or there's something fundamentally wrong with the premises. Now, I think we might even be able to speed things up, but in order to do that, you have to know this number here. Typical sensitivity for SETI, these are the best numbers, but these are the sorts of things you can get down at Arecibo and maybe eventually with the Allen Telescope Array when you get it built out, is 10 to the minus 25 watts per meter square. Okay, that's, that's the weakest sort of signal you could find coming in on a 1 hertz channel and so forth. Now, you know, what is that? Well, I mean, it's just a number, but let, let me give you another example. If you take one of those Allen Telescope Array antennas and you aim it at the sky and you're collecting a signal that's at that level and you've been doing that ever since the dinosaurs were snuffed, in other words, for 65 million years, after 65 million years of collecting that with one of our antennas, the total amount of energy we'll have collected is the amount of one ant raising one leg once. Okay. <laughs> so it's not a lot. I mean, that, that, that would suggest to you, that, that should impress you in something. Very little of this talk will impress you, but that should impress you because that shows you how good radio technology is. You can find very, very weak signals, okay? And, and it sounds like we should be able to find really pipsqueak transmitters out there. But, of course, space is vast, all right? And the consequence of that is that the signals, of course, are attenuated by distance. So here's the computation. This is another number you can, if you don't like this number, you can try this number here on the bottom at your next cocktail party. Let's assume that the aliens were aiming an antenna our way, trying to get in touch because they want to sell used cars or whatever. They're 1,000 light years away. That's pretty far. That's farther than we generally look, but let's say. 1,000 light years away, they've got an antenna as big as the one down in Puerto Rico at Arecibo, which is 1,000 feet across, right? Hold 4 billion scoops of Baskin-Robbins. 
right? And they've got that aimed at us, and we're looking at them with a similarly sized antenna. What would it take for them to get in touch with us at 1,000 light years? They'd need a 6 megawatt transmitter, 6 million watts. That's not much. I mean, the Arecibo antenna has a radar on it, and I think it's, it's either 1 or 2 megawatts. I think it may be 2 megawatts these days. It used to be 1. In other words, it's very close to that number. In other words, what I'm telling you is that even with the kind of technology we have, you could establish this communication link even over a thousand light years distance. Okay? However, there is <laughs> there's an insect here in the ointment because I've assumed that they have an antenna aimed at us and they're just, you know, transmitting away. Now why would they be doing that? And they have to be doing it for a long time because remember when we go down we look at some star system, you know, we might look at some star system over here three years from now and we'll spend, you know, like three minutes looking at it at a given frequency. Right, three minutes. The aliens get three minutes to get in touch from that star system. So in order to have any chance that we're going to hear them, they've got to be beaming their signal at us for a long time, typically thousands of years. This is the Drake equation, but, but that's what they have to be doing. So here's an alien. It was pointed out to me that his hands are not great. But in any case, here's an alien. So you have to ask, you know, are they going to do that? Are they going to beam a very powerful signal at us for thousands of years? Because that's an assumption in what we do now, right? Or it seems to me that it is. And I'm, I'm somewhat doubtful that they would be willing to do that because they don't know we're here. All right, now here's uh, I Love Lucy, of course, which I think uh, was first broadcast in 1953. I think it was 53. So that's what? That's 57 light years out, those early episodes, okay? So you can work this out that, uh, you know, I Love Lucy is washing over another star system at the rate of about one a day, which you'd think would make the advertisers happy, but... You know, they might not like Fred Mertz's jokes or something. Okay, but that's still, it's only, you know, 50-some light years out. And we haven't been broadcasting too much before that. Well, that means that anybody who's responding to us now can't be more than half that distance because, you know, you want to see the response. And within the distance of the signals that we've been sending out, within half that distance, there are only a couple of thousand stars. There are only a couple of thousand that know we're here. I think you can safely tell your neighbors that nobody knows Homo sapiens exist, except maybe domesticated cats. Nobody knows that we're here, right? So when your next door neighbor, you know, tells you the stories of how they're being hauled out of their bedrooms at night by little gray guys who are, you know, doing things that their moms wouldn't approve of, you can you can say, "Gee, that's remarkable that they've come all the way here to do that because they don't know we exist." I'm just unlucky for you. Okay. All right. Um, now you might say, oh, yeah, but maybe they found some other signal. Well, the, the facts are our city lights have not reached them either. To, to find our city lights, by the way, is very hard. You might work out how big an antenna or rather a, a telescope you need to see the lights of Earth from, you know, a couple of hundred light years. It's, it's big. It's like a, an antenna about the size of the solar system. Sorry, a mirror that's big. It's very big. Uh, a chlor the, the, the chlorofluorocarbons in our atmosphere that would tell them that we have refrigerators, that information hasn't reached them. Smoke, smog, the CO2 in the atmosphere. The aliens are always coming here to save us from ourselves. Right? Why are the aliens here now, Bob? Well, because they're unhappy about what we're doing to the environment. And, and, and also, they're worried about nuclear war. Well, doggone it, they don't know about any of that stuff. Right? And so, you know, if they're here now, it's, it's not because they knew about that stuff. It's like, you know, you're going to save the hippos without knowing about the hippos. Okay. So, you know, it doesn't make too much sense to me that they're going to be relentlessly targeting, uh, targeting us with a very big antenna with a lot of power. But you could say, yeah, that's okay. Maybe they're really broadcasting. Making, maybe they're broad, you know, transmitting a signal that just goes to everyone, like KGO, right? Maybe they're doing that. So they got to, you know, maybe they have a big transmitter down in the center of the galaxy because, after all, it's, you know, that's the place to go. And it's just belching out, you know, Used car ads, as I suggested, or maybe, you know, join our book club, whatever it is, okay? And we'll pick that up. Well, that, that, that's maybe not a bad idea. We should look at the Galactic Center. That's the one special place in the whole galaxy, after all, the one very special place. I always think of, you know, when Captain Kirk is beaming down some guys down to some godforsaken planet, you know, I'll beam them down, I'll see you down there. What do you mean you'll see me down there? I, you know, I don't have a map of the place. They can always beam to the north or south pole. Everybody knows how to find those. In the galaxy, there's only one unique place, of course, and that's the center. So maybe they're broadcasting everywhere. All we have to do is look at the center of the galaxy. 